Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 28, The History of Bulgaria. So today's drink of choice is Bulgarina wine. Bulgaria is famous for its wine and was formerly in the 80s one of the largest wine exporters in the world. I try to find this one specific type of wine called Mavrud that is supposedly super good and has this kind of goofy legend of a youth killing a lion while drunk on wine and then bringing wine back to Bulgaria. But all I could find was just this Bulgarina wine. It's a red wine, which is my preferred wine, and it's a good red wine. But I don't feel like it's anything super special. I would have it again, but I don't think I'd go out of my way to try this specific wine again. So the Republic of Bulgaria is located in the Balkan region of Europe, with Romania and the Danube River to the north, Serbia and North Macedonia to the west, Greece and Turkey to the south, and the Black Sea to the east. Bulgaria is divided into roughly two separate regions. In the west and center of the country, you find mountain ranges of the country, like the Balkan, Rila, and Rudolpa Mountains. When you move east, you enter the low-lying plains where most of the large cities in the country are found. It is also a broadly temperate country, with the mountains obviously being colder, and then the further southeast you go, the warmer it gets. Bulgaria has a little under 7 million people in it. It is mostly made up of ethnic Bulgarians, with roughly 85% being ethnic Bulgarians. Bulgarians are a Slavic people, being related to the nearby Croats and Serbs, and also the further off Russians and Poles. They, while found all over the country, are most prominent in the west of the country. The next largest ethnic group are ethnic Turks, with roughly 9% being Turkish. They tend to be found in the south or in the northeast. There is also a large Roma community in the country, with estimates ranging from 4 to 11% being ethnic Roma. They are found spread out throughout the country, but many are found in the northwest corner of the country. Finally, there are smaller groups of Russians, Romanians, Armenians, Another usually Eastern European people found in the country. The official language of the country is Bulgarian, which is obviously spoken by most ethnic Bulgarians, and most non-Bulgarians will speak it at least as a second language. Bulgarian is a South Slavic language that is, depending on who you ask, either closely related to Macedonian, or Macedonian is essentially just a dialect of Bulgarian. Turkish and Romani are spoken obviously by their respective ethnic groups, and English, Russian, and German are some of the most common foreign languages spoken in the country. Finally, Bulgaria is mostly Christian. The majority of the population belongs to the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, with most Bulgarians and a decent number of Roma practicing the Orthodox faith. The numbers for Orthodox can vary pretty wildly, from 60 to 85% being Orthodox. Islam is the next largest faith, with 8 to 12% being Muslim, mostly Sunni Muslim, and Muslims tend to come from the Turkish community, with smaller numbers from the Roma, and Bulgarian Muslims called Pomaks. You can also find smaller religious communities of Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Neo-Pagans. Irreligious people make up a large but unclear amount of the population, where some are between 10-30% to 30 holding no real religious beliefs. So let's begin talking about Bulgarian history. Bulgarians tend to have a very ancient view of themselves. Many claim to be the descendants of the ancient Thracian people, that settled in the region starting around the first millennium BCE. The Thracians, for most of their history, were never an organized people, instead being divided into several small cities, tribes, and alliances that fought not only each other, but also the ancient Greeks and other people around them. They were noted for being brutal warriors and being used as mercenaries, but they were also noted for being skilled gold workers and going back to the intro, drank a lot of wine. The Thracians would be conquered by the Persian Empire in the early 500s BCE, after the Persians were defeated by the Greeks, they were briefly reunited under a single kingdom, the Odrysian Kingdom, but most of the kingdom would fall under the ancient Macedonian Empire until it was conquered by Rome in the early 100s BCE. Thrace would experience Greek and Roman influence, with most of the region being Hellenized and Latinized, although the region's rural nature also meant the process took a very long time. Thrace under Rome would also be the birthplace of several Roman and early Byzantine emperors. With Rome's power weakening starting in the 3rd century, peoples from Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Eurasian steppe all began moving into the region. Notably, in the 500s, Slavic tribes began moving into the region, absorbing the remaining Thracians, along with any Greeks, Goths, or Latins found in the region. These Slavs are considered the second ancestral group that make up the modern Bulgarian ethnic group. The final ancestral group that forms the modern Bulgarian nation would be the Bulgars, 
Now, the Bulgars were a Turkic people found on the Eurasian steppe. In the 600s, they had established a protostate in what is now southern Ukraine, known as Old Great Bulgaria. In the late 600s, faced with raids from other nomadic steppe peoples, the Bulgars split, with groups of Bulgars fleeing all over, from Iran to Italy, and even moving into what is now Tartarstan in Russia, forming the Volga Bulgarian state. However, importantly for Bulgarian history, a group of them went south along the Danube River. There they banded together with several Slavic tribes in the region and defeated a Byzantine army sent against them, forcing the Byzantines to recognize this new power. This new state, the first Bulgarian empire, found itself as a major player in the region. It starting off was mostly based around the Danube River, including a lot of what is now Romania, but slowly began pushing south into Bulgaria and the Macedonia region. It would become one of the main rivals to the Byzantines, and for the next four centuries, Bulgaria and Byzantium were not always at war, but you could expect at least every decade some war or conflict to break out. Famously, one of the Bulgar leaders, Krum, is said to have killed a Byzantine emperor in battle, and then used said emperor's skull as a drinking mug. But drinking from the skulls of their enemies was not something all Bulgarians could partake in. Well, actually it seems like it was just Krum that did that, but importantly, Bulgaria in its early days was fairly divided between the Bulgars, who made up most of the elite of the empire, and the Slavs, who made up most of the peasantry. This division in the kingdom led to several revolts. In 864 CE, Boris I would convert to Christianity, partially to help ease tensions between the Bulgars and the Slavs, but also to help establish itself as a Christian state, like those around it. The Bulgarian church would be founded at this time, Eastern Orthodox in theology, but still independent from the Patriarch of Constantinople. Bulgaria would, both before and after the process of Christianization, have a flourishing culture, with the Cyrillic alphabet being created in Bulgaria, and many pieces of beautiful artwork being created. With the reign of Simon the Great from 893 to 937, having Bulgaria reach its height, he defeated the Magyars from the north, took much of northern Greece from the Byzantines, and suppressed revolts from the Serbs. Bulgarian monarchs frequently made it a goal to try and take Constantinople from the Byzantines, but this always ended, at best, being just out of reach, and at worst, being a total disaster. Instability at home was always a threat, and revolts and coups were not uncommon. Bulgaria also found itself constantly surrounded by hostile states, and its attempts to make friends often failed due to skillful Byzantine diplomacy. Bulgaria also did, and really up till today, lacked any real naval experience. So taking Constantinople was fairly unfeasible. While Simon would make Bulgaria the dominant player in the Balkans, this wouldn't last. Byzantium started crushing the Muslims in Asia, and were able to focus on Bulgaria, which was weakened by various states and peoples attacking it. The Byzantines under Basil the Bulgar Slayer, a name that surely doesn't spell good things for the Bulgarians, would in 1018 conquer the Bulgarians, ending the First Bulgarian Empire. However, with a name like the First Bulgarian Empire, there's of course going to be a sequel. Byzantine rule would attempt to Hellenize the Bulgarians, and reduce the influence of the Bulgarian church. But Byzantium was also experienced invasion from the Turks, and tension with Western Europe, so they struggled to control Bulgaria. In 1185, two brothers led several local elites in northern Bulgaria to revolt, and the Second Bulgarian Empire was formed. The Second Empire was noted for establishing a capital at Ternovo, and experienced a renaissance in art and culture. The Second Empire was, like the first, a very powerful player in the Balkans, rivaling Byzantium, and occasionally even being led by a good Tsar, such as Kaiolian, the Roman Slayer, a name that is less badass when you realize he gave it to himself, even Asen II, and the swineherder Ivolo. But the problems the First Empire faced were still present. No navy, no real friends, suffered from infighting, and really relied on the Byzantines being weak in order to expand. Even worse, Mongols and Tartars from Central Asia began raiding northern Bulgaria, weakening the state even further. But the empire would manage to hold out against most of its traditional rivals, until it falls in 1396, after being slowly subjugated and conquered by the expanding Ottoman Empire. The fall of the empire would result in many Bulgarian scholars, merchants, artists, and monks to flee the country into Romania and the growing Russian state. Ottoman rule in Bulgaria is one that is looked at with a lot of hate, but it's also important to note that Ottoman rule did importantly bring some sort of peace to Bulgaria. While the past 800 years had seen wars, revolts, and invasions constantly breaking out and occurring in Bulgaria, Ottoman rule was mostly peaceful in the beginning. Bulgaria for the first roughly 400 years of Ottoman rule 
was deep enough in Ottoman territory to not have to worry about a marauding army coming in and killing the people of the region. Ottoman rule would see the start of the Turkish and Roma community in Bulgaria, with both groups entering into the region after the Ottoman conquest. The Turks often tended to be the superiors of the Bulgarian and Roma peasantry they ruled over. Technically, this had nothing to do with ancestry, but simply religion. Any Bulgarian that was willing to convert to Islam would be offered greater social mobility, granted less taxes, and wouldn't have to worry about their young sons being first into the Janissary Corps. The Janissaries are a complicated military unit, because on one hand, they were boys forcefully taken from their families to serve as slave soldiers, and this made many people understandably upset. But there were some people who actually hoped their sons would become Janissaries, because if you became a Janissary, yeah, you were forced into the job, but you could get a lot of influence, wealth, and power. The Roma community, it should be noted, were unique, treated lesser as Muslims regardless of religion, but were still above Christians. So Ottoman rule was not all bad for everyone living in Bulgaria, but there is very much a reason people in Bulgaria do not look fondly on Ottoman rule. Nobody likes having a foreign power control you. The Bulgarians, while they weren't forced to convert to Islam, were pressured and de facto punished for not changing their religion. Even the Bulgarian Orthodox Church was put under the Greek Orthodox Church in an attempt to control the Bulgarians. When the Bulgarians did attempt to fight back against the Ottomans, which wasn't super common, but it did happen every so often, they often suffered brutal reprisals. As Ottoman power weakened starting in the 17th century, Ottoman power in Bulgaria shifted increasingly to local lords and nobles, who could do pretty much whatever they want with very little recourse. Revolts began picking up, but still Bulgaria went into the 19th century still under the Turkish yoke. As nationalism swept through much of Europe, Bulgaria also experienced a national awakening. The Bulgarian language, which had several different dialects, was standardized. Bulgarians were encouraged to look at themselves as a part of a wider nation, with its own unique history, culture, and destiny. They began demanding that the Bulgarian church be given more autonomy, women to be educated to be better patriots and mothers, which is kind of an interesting take on women's rights, give us more rights so we can be better mothers, and Bulgaria to be given greater autonomy, or even outright independence. Revolutionary nationalist movements began to spring up throughout the Bulgarian population, and not just Bulgaria itself, but also the highly ethnically diverse Macedonia region and in the Bulgarian diaspora. In 1876, after non-Muslims suffered a massive tax increase, Bulgarian nationalists started the April Revolt, planning on freeing the country from Ottoman rule, similar to what Romania and Serbia achieved around it. However, the Bulgarians failed to properly plan the uprising, and were crushed by overwhelming Ottoman numbers. The Ottomans, in response, took to mass reprisals, killing thousands to even tens of thousands of innocent Bulgarian civilians. This shocked a lot of Europe, and especially the Russians. The Russians, who considered themselves the defenders of their Slavic Orthodox brethren, pressed the Ottomans to give greater autonomy to the Balkan nations. When they refused, Russia went to war. Now, Russia didn't go to war for purely altruistic reasons. Nations rarely act in an altruistic manner. But they did believe an independent Bulgaria could weaken their traditional enemies, the Ottomans. And so, in 1877, Russia invaded the Ottoman Empire. With aid from the Romanians and Bulgarian insurgents, they pushed until they were just a few miles outside the Ottoman capital. By March 1878, the Ottomans were forced to surrender, and Bulgaria was promised some sort of independence. This state, initially proposed to include a huge proportion of the southeastern Balkans, was scaled back by the great powers into being divided between the princedom of Bulgaria, which would still technically be a part of the Ottoman Empire, but was given so much autonomy they were virtually independent, along with southwestern Bulgaria, forming the autonomous province of eastern Romalia. Now before we end Ottoman rule, I do actually want to go back to the ethnic origins of the Bulgarians because they are not solid and they do change depending on who you are talking to, along with the time and place. So for example, when Bulgaria is trying to establish friendly relations with the Russians and other Slavic people, the Slavic origins are played up, while the Thracian and Bulgar origins are played down. Meanwhile, in World War II, spoiler alert for later in the episode, when Bulgaria is trying to appeal to the Nazis, who view the Slavs as inferior to them, it plays up its Thracian origins while playing down its Slavic origins. The Bulgarian nationalist view of their history, and really any nationalist telling of history, tends to overemphasize certain groups and removes other groups from the historical experience to fit a narrative that often misses a lot of the complexities and nuances of its history. The book Bulgaria and Europe Shifting Identities 
talks about the culture wars that often erupt when talking about Bulgarian history, between patriotic Bulgarians who view history in one way, and what the book calls the, quote, elite in the making, who take a more critical role about Bulgaria, and criticize a lot of the tropes often used in nationalistic history of Bulgaria, where Bulgaria is portrayed as uniquely amazing and its enemies as uniquely cruel and evil. This is not unique to Bulgaria. Almost every country has massive debates of its history. I really say all this because, well, it's interesting. It's important to remember that all historians have their own biases, except for me because I'm based an epic and historian-pilled, and to not take all historians at their word. And also to remember that I'm trying to summarize like 3,000 years of history in roughly 9 pages, so I will be missing a lot of nuance, especially when I'm talking about 100 years of history in just a paragraph or two. So if you want to learn more, I'd really recommend listening to the Bulgarian History Podcast. He has almost 200 episodes of Bulgarian History, starting from the First Bulgarian Empire, with the latest episode talking about the early days of Bulgarian independence. Speaking of the early days of Bulgarian independence, they weren't amazing for Bulgaria. Bulgaria found itself with very few friends. First off, everyone around them could at best be said to have serious concerns about them, and at worst hated their guts. The Ottomans weren't happy about giving away a large chunk of their weakening empire, and weren't happy to have a hostile nation so close to the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. Romanians and Bulgarians both claim the region of Dobruja, which has a high degree of ethnic diversity. The Serbs also claimed several towns on the border with Bulgaria, which led to a border war in 1885. But they, along with the Greeks, also importantly claimed the region of Macedonia, which, as mentioned earlier, had a high degree of ethnic diversity, and were considered important historical territory to these three groups. But even states outside the Balkans weren't happy for the Bulgarians. The Russians, who you think would be best friends with the Bulgarians, were actually relatively cold towards them, for most of Bulgaria's early history. When Bulgaria was given its status as a princedom, they had to choose a prince that would rule them, when they chose a German noble to be their prince, it upset the Russians, who while not outright hostile towards Bulgaria, grew closer to Serbia, who they trusted more. The Western powers, like the UK and France, never even really tried to connect with Bulgaria. Germany and Austria-Hungary were growing friendly with the Ottomans, and didn't want this new Bulgarian state to harm their new friend. So Bulgaria is ultimately left on its own. Domestically, Bulgaria is doing better, but it's still fairly unstable. It had reunited with Eastern Rumelia and solidified its border with Serbia in 1885, and in 1908 declared itself as the Sardom of Bulgaria, officially breaking off the Turkish rule in Bulgaria. However, Bulgarian politics was anything but stable. The country was divided between liberals and conservatives, with both sides willing to use violence to achieve their goals. There would be an attempted coup in 1886 that led to the first prince to flee the country, and brought about Ferdinand I into power. Ferdinand encouraged the country to continue to pursue an expansionist foreign policy, holding close ties with revolutionary movements in Macedonia, such as the IMRO. In 1812, Bulgaria made an alliance with Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro, and invaded the Ottoman Empire, kicking off the First Balkan War, which probably shouldn't have that name because even in this episode I've referenced a couple different wars in the Balkans. These four Balkan states each wanted more land from the Ottoman Empire, with their combined forces and modernized armies managing to defeat the Ottomans, who were weakened by a war with Italy. The Bulgarian army moved into Thrace near Constantinople, and attempted to push to the city of Thessaloniki, but the Greeks took the city before them. In mid-1913, the Ottomans were forced to the peace table, and gave away most of their European territories. For the most part, the Balkan powers were pleased, but not Bulgaria. They felt that the Serbs and Greece had gained land that should have belonged to them at the peace conference. A little less than a month after the First Balkan War, the Second Balkan War began, with Bulgaria invading into Serbia and Greece. The Bulgarians, while they outnumbered the Greeks and Serbs, failed to advance deep into enemy territory. In July of 1913, both the Romanians and the Ottomans decided to invade Bulgaria, taking back territory they believed was rightfully theirs. Since most of the army was at the Western Front, the Romanians and Ottomans were able to push deep into Bulgaria, and by the time the war was over, Romanian troops were just seven miles away from Sofia. Bulgaria at the end of the Balkan Wars was bigger than when it started, with it taking more land in the south and even gained access to the Aegean Sea. However, Bulgaria did lose southern Dobruja, and they felt they had been betrayed by the Serbs and Greeks. There was a saying that Bulgaria after the war bordered itself, and was filled with Bulgarian refugees fleeing violence. Bulgaria felt more alone than ever. 
Bulgaria would spend the first year of World War I on the sidelines, but in 1915 it joined the Central Powers, which included their bitter rivals the Ottomans. Bulgaria's goals in this war were the same as their goals in the Balkan Wars. They wanted to expand into Macedonia and take Dobruja, something they could only achieve by siding with the Central Powers. They occupied parts of Serbia after Serbia was conquered, and fought the Greeks, Brits, and French in Macedonia. When Romania joined the Allies, Bulgaria invaded Dobruja, and managed with the aid from the Germans and Austrians to take Romania out of the war. The Bulgarians were in a pretty good position in 1918, but unfortunately for them, all their allies had collapsed, and Bulgaria ended up on the losing side of the war. In the war's aftermath, Bulgaria had lost all the territory they had gained, along with a coastal region around the Aegean Sea to Greece, and some border towns to the Serbs. The war's aftermath forced Ferdinand to resign as Tsar, with his son Boris III becoming the new Tsar. Bulgaria would, in the interwar years, become increasingly violent. In 1923, a right-wing coup overthrew the radical agrarian prime minister and his government that had taken charge after World War I. The government, after the coup, began cracking down on leftist groups, which resulted in many left-wing groups going underground. Anarchists attempted to assassinate Boris, and in 1925, over 150 people were killed in a communist bombing at a funeral service for a murdered police chief. After a brief period where left-wing forces were allowed to operate, another coup took place in 1934, which resulted in a crackdown on the left and a right-wing government coming into power. This government would only last a short while until Boris decided to take matters into his own hands and put a weak prime minister in charge of the country. Boris, now fully in charge of the country, set to work. He banned all political parties and began looking to expand Bulgaria, like his father before him. In 1941, Bulgaria joined the Axis powers. However, much to the annoyance of Germany, it refused to join the invasion of Yugoslavia, Greece, or the USSR. Instead, it chose to occupy parts of Greece and Yugoslavia. It would spend most of the war fighting off Greeks, Serbs, and later communist resistance movements, which attempted to halt Bulgaria's involvement in the war. Bulgaria deported around 11,000 Jews from its occupied territories to concentration camps, and while it didn't deport the Jews found in Bulgarian proper due to intervention from the Tsar, it did take their land and property, and they were given a second-class citizen status. In 1943, Boris died, some believing he was poisoned. His six-year-old son, Simon II, was put on the throne, with a regency taking place. This regency wouldn't last long, however, as the Bulgarian communists, with aid from the Soviets and dissident groups in Bulgaria, overthrew the government in late 1944. The Bulgarians switched sides and joined the Allies, helping the Soviets drive the Nazis out of the Balkans and Central Europe. This new government also engaged in a wave of mass killings, as those associated with the previous regime, or deemed too anti-communist, were killed. Also, notably, Bulgaria was the only Axis-aligned country that gained land after the war, with Bulgaria allowed to keep southern Dobruja, since Romania, another Axis-aligned power, had spent a lot of its energy fighting the Soviets. The communists were backed by a decently large group of people in Bulgaria. Obviously, Marxists and left-wing figures who were targeted by the previous government were going to support the communists. But they also got a lot of support from trade unions and Bulgarians who wanted to maintain close ties with Russia, since Russia was a leading communist state at the time. It also helped that the communists were really the first group in Bulgaria to have a platform beyond, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we expanded, and talked of improving the material conditions of the average Bulgarian. With this new way of doing politics, and assisted by infiltrating and cracking down on any potential opposition, the communists quickly grew to become by far the largest political force in the country. In 1946, the communists officially instated a Marxist-Leninist People's Republic, and Simon was forced into exile. Communist rule would help modernize the country. While Bulgaria's economy was largely based around agriculture, pre-communist, the communists made it a goal to institute agrarian reform and industrialize the country. Bulgaria's economy was heavily connected with the Soviet economy. The communists made it a goal to improve education and tried to improve literacy rates in Bulgaria, especially among the Turks and Roma, and worked to promote Bulgarian culture abroad and at home. Communist rule also offered increased workers' benefits and encouraged women to go to work. They also made it a goal to crack down on any potential dissidents, sending those who opposed the regime to work camps and limiting the role of the Orthodox Church and Muslim clerics in the country while also actively targeting the small Catholic and Protestant community in the country, since they were considered foreign. However, after a period of intense repression in the late 40s, Bulgaria became less focused on targeting dissidents, although they did still do that. Starting in the late 70s, the government attempted to assimilate Turks into wider Bulgarian society, 
This was done partially for fear that the large ethnic minority might cause trouble in Bulgaria, and also to help improve the ethnic Bulgarian birth rate, which started to go into decline as Bulgaria began to become more industrialized and people waited longer and longer to have children. The government tried to force Turks to adopt Bulgarian names and discouraged the use of Turkish or participating in traditional Turkish cultural activities. When the Turks began to protest this in 1989, the Bulgarian government began encouraging Bulgarian Turks to leave the country and go to Turkey. Around 350,000 would leave their homes, but Turkey didn't know how to settle so many new refugees, and many Bulgarian Turks either quickly returned home or were forced to wait at the border for a long period of time. Bulgarian Turks, who had since independence never really been a rich community, grew poorer and poorer, and ethnic tension increased. In the aftermath of this, along with protests in other communist states, pressure began to mount on the government. Turkish rights groups, along with environmentalists, human rights activists, and even Bulgarian nationalists, upset the government hadn't gone far enough in removing Turks, all protested the government. In 1990, multi-party elections were held, and communist rule in Bulgaria was brought to an end. Although, I will note, the communist party didn't really go away. It just changed its name to the Bulgarian Socialist Party, and began advocating for social democratic policies, and still exists as a significant party today. Bulgaria post-communism opened up to Western Europe. It began liberalizing its economy, and many companies and land were privatized. The 90s were pretty rough for the economy, but the economy, GDP, and foreign investment in the country all have been increasing since the 2000s. Its economy nowadays is largely based around manufacturing and tobacco. It joined NATO in 2004 and the EU in 2007. Although, I will note, Bulgaria has not broken off completely from Russia, with trade, tourism, and commerce very common, and the Bulgarian socialists and nationalists tending to have more positive relations with Russia. Bulgaria, however, didn't have positive relations with many of its neighbors after the fall of communism, a very unique event in Bulgaria, I know. The treatment of ethnic Turks and the subsequent refugee crisis didn't endear Bulgaria to Turkey. Romania and Bulgaria had problems with pollution on the Danube, which has created friction. Bulgaria disliked Serbian treatment towards Bulgarians in Serbia, wanting the Serbian government to do more to protect them. And while Bulgaria for the most part resolved disputes with these three countries, and they all have pretty okay relations right now. North Macedonia is the country Bulgaria has the most beef with. Several Bulgarian governments and many political elites would argue that North Macedonia should simply not exist. They see the Macedonian language and people as essentially one and the same as them. And to avoid adding another 10 minutes to this episode explaining all the ins and outs of the dispute, I will just say that Bulgaria has been blocking North Macedonia from the EU, and there's just a lot of tension between the two countries. Now, I don't want to talk about every political figure post-communism, but I do want to highlight one. After the fall of communism, Simon II returned to the country and formed a political movement, National Movement Simon II, or NSMP. NSMP promoted liberal ideas, and after the 2001 election, Simon was elected as Prime Minister of Bulgaria. I think this might be the only time in modern history a monarch has been democratically elected into a country's highest office, so that's cool. But remember that declining birth rate I talked about a bit ago? Well, it never went away. Bulgaria experienced a population decline, as people waited longer and longer to have kids, if they had them at all, and many Bulgarians left the country looking often for work. Communism had offered a protection for many workers and a semblance of stability. Cost of living has increased and jobs are no longer as secure, and especially among ethnic minorities and those in rural areas, poverty has increased. With this poverty also came more and more organized crime groups propping up and corruption followed. Bulgaria is one of the most corrupt countries in the EU, with most major political figures being accused of corruption and nepotism, which again encourages people to leave the country. While there were 8.5 million people in the country in 1990, there are now only a little over 6.5 million. Corruption has led to several large protests in the country, and recently resulted in a year-long government crisis. After the scheduled election in April of 2021 created a parliament that was divided by political friction, Bulgaria had to have another two elections in 2021 before eventually a coalition of Bulgarian socialists, along with a coalition of parties strongly opposed to corruption, was formed. I made an episode after the first election in April that explained the parties present in the legislature at that time. It's a little outdated, but most of the parties I talked about in the episode are still relevant. The current prime minister of the country is Kirill Petkov. A member of the party, we continue the change. Petkov's party has promised to further support the EU, wants to accept more Ukrainian refugees into Bulgaria, and promotes anti-corruption measures. 
but he and his party also aren't the first to promise such a move, so it wouldn't necessarily get your hopes up. The president of the country is Ruman Radev. While the president is a much more ceremonial role, Radev has sought to promote a foreign policy which isn't as antagonistic towards Russia. So why does Bulgaria exist? Bulgaria was formed in an incredibly hostile environment. Historically, it has found itself surrounded by enemies, and yet it still exists. Part of this is the Danube River in the north and the mountain ranges in the west blocking off invading armies, but it's also the fierce tenacity of the Bulgarians themselves. They have continually managed to preserve their culture, language, and religion throughout the centuries. Regardless of what they go through, you can expect the Bulgarians to continue to try and hold on and protect what makes them special. Up next, we go to Burkina Faso. Prepare for the French, communism, and a lot of coups, including one very recently. So thanks for listening. Up next, I'll talk about Croatian political parties, and then I'll talk about Belgian political parties, and I should have someone from the country helping me with that episode, so... That'll be exciting. And then I'll talk about Burkina Faso. But yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you want, you can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are the Ambling Historians series Crash Course on Bulgarian History, the Atlantic's documentary, Bulgaria, the World's Fastest Shrinking Country, the Bulgarian History Podcast, which, again, I would really, really recommend if you like podcasts and you like Bulgarian history, you will listen to them. The Cold Wars video on Sovietization of Bulgaria and Romania. Neville Ford's section of the book A History of Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, Romania, and Turkey. It's kind of an old and outdated book, and it has some kind of racist stereotypes about the Turks and Bulgarians and just people in the Balkans. Um, but it's an interesting document to look at if you want to get, like, a Western perspective of Bulgaria in 1915. Geography Now's video on Bulgaria, The Great Wars video on Bulgaria in World War I, Fernand the First, and the Treaty of Nuweli, History Den's video on the history of the Thracians, Jasby's video on the Russo Turkish War of 1877 to 1878, Nalegia's video on the First, Second, and Third Balkan War, along with their video on Bulgaria in World War II, Stefanos Kastiak's book, or I think he's actually the editor, so it's not really his book. Um, but the book Bulgaria and Europe Shifting Identities, Gerald Kunis' documentary Bulgaria the Long Revolution, Mr. History's video A Super Quick History of Bulgaria, Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages video The First Bulgarian Empire, and finally Wikipedia.